battery is low on it. But uh, since William Guy is reading, he has, he does not have a really loud voice. You know, it doesn't, it's not irritating. He has a low, lovely voice. And um, it's perfect for reading what he has written. And uh, it's just as much fun to listen to, if not more, than to read what he's, what he's signed. But uh, it's our pleasure to have uh, William Gay as uh, a presenter at our conference every year. He is called the, um, the Faulkner of Tennessee, and I can understand perfectly why he's called that. So just sit back and enjoy William Gay and pretend you're in a different world because that's where we are. Uh, William, are you ready? Yeah. Okay.
listening to the drum and bees fluttering themselves on the rocks and wind falling through. Before the day was over, he had returned to the light to puzzle anew over the hole. He learned no more than the nothing he already knew. In the morning, there were three new holes, somewhat shallower, but spaced over a wider area, as if someone had been digging for something at random. Be damned, he said again. He stared at the harried earth, suspecting perhaps some magnetic anomaly. He sucked meteors and asteroids from the deep band of space he hurled through. He stared upward, seeking some cosmic mirror whose reflections marvelously cast chaos into order, righted the perverse and disorder, but appeared only into blue emptiness, that shaped his wisp of clouds that fled westward ahead of the sun. He stood listening to the morning sounds that mock him with the familiarity. He could hear the crinkling of hot tins, the pop of barn rafters warping in the heat, the furtive scudding of a lizard. A thin film of perspiration crept across his shoulders, deepening, dampening his chambered shirt. He counted the pigs again without expecting to find one gone. They were all there and he was half disappointed, surprised to find himself willing to sacrifice a pig for an explanation. A pig that they could have understood, there was reason in it, sense. There was no sense in this hole feeding his hog lot. After a while, he got a manure cork and began half-heartedly to shovel earth back into the hole. He took a long nap that afternoon, and about dark, he made himself a quart jar of coffee and carried it with him down to the barn. He had an old browning over and under, and he carted that too. He carried that too. In the hayloft, he arranged bales and tied into a comfortable chair and seated himself out of sight to see what transpired. For a long time, nothing did. Dark deep in the shadows took the world. He sat immersed in the crowds of insects and the timeless stalling of whippoorwill. There was something of eternity in these sounds, at once bitter and reassuring. He heard them as a boy, as a young man. They sounded the same then as now. In this curiously altered stillness, he felt he might even hear his wife open the kitchen door and call his name. His son might be on the spring path following him, a small farm forever stalemated that time. He drank from the jar of bitter coffee and wiped his mouth on the sleeve, forced his attention to the barnyard below it. It lay in darkness, but after an hour or so, the moon cradled up under the eastern trees and the pale illumination crept across the face of the land, tree and fence and stone, imbued with significance like ancient in a dream. The moon was high over the tree line and it just had at 10 o'clock or better before he saw anything stir. When the boy came, he came up from the branch and run with silent still, easing to the water of gum and pursuing peering all about, cautious of the raging deer. Apparently satisfied, he came out of the brush and approached the fence, carrying a burlap bag and a shovel whose handle was longer than he was tall. It was the Hodges boy. Well, he didn't no more than nine or ten years old, he thought. The boy threw the sack over and leaned the shovel against the fence and clambered over. He took up the shovel and immediately fell to work, selecting a fresh corner of the lot to dig in. Just clock in and go to work, the old man thought in puzzlement. <laughs> the boy dug for some time and then unpocketed a flashlight, dealt on the scattered manure he took from the hole, breaking carefully through it with his hand. Leaving so in the earth, he raised his face to a moon, clocking on westward, and then arose and commenced shoveling again. The old man was at a loss. For a moment, he thought of Heidi's grandfather digging for money on the Mormon place. Perhaps some genetic quirk had encoded it in the third generation. A trait so degenerated by now that nothing remains so the compulsion to dig your mantle. Just on the off chance, someone might have buried something worth reclaiming. Oliver rose as stealthily as he could, even so it was meat pot, and he stood still and silent until he saw the boy hadn't hurt. Then he moved cautiously toward the ladder and climbed down it. 
leads into the moonlit big lot. Hodges was still digging. Oliver approached within a foot or so of his back. Howdy, and said, the boy dropped the shovel as if electricity had coursed through it and left five or six inches into the air. When his feet touched dirt, they were already pedaling as if he rode an invisible bicycle and he was almost immediately at the fence. Oliver caught him as he was scrambling over the topmost slab and bit him, kicking and squirming and cursing and set him back to earth. Let me alone, the boy was yelling. Whoa, well, young fella, hold on a minute here. Nobody wants to hurt you. I just want to know what you're up to. Hodges was trying to jerk his arm for it. None of your goddamn business. Now let me alone. You're young Hodges, ain't you? What's it to you? Well, they don't call you Hodges, do they? What's your first name? Yeah, I guess you'd like that, wouldn't you? Let me tell you my name so you can run straight to the law with it. Hell, son, I don't make no name. I got you in the bed, right by the shape of bridge. I just asked you to be polite. <laughs> My name's Clifford. All right, that sounds better. And just so you know, I ain't never been one to run over quick to the law. Now, you reckon if I turn you loose, you can control the impulse to jump that fence? I ain't done that. You move right here for a fellow just taking a night air. Ain't none too quality about those copperheads, neither. Oliver released his grip on the boy. Now, what's my hog lot got you can't dig up nowhere else? Wouldn't you like to know? Oliver had been wanting to smoke and been afraid of setting the hay in the barn off the fire. Now he packed a bowl of his pipe and struck a kitchen match on his thumbnail and lit the tobacco. When he spoke, his voice was furred by the smoke. What was you digging for? It ain't none of your business. Well, I reckon it's your shovel, but it's my lot and my house been standing around putting some sleep and watching you digging, I suppose. Now, what is it? Do you just like digging, or is there something particular about my hog lot that appeals to you? The boy seems to be considering. There was a shrewdness in his face with the transparent painting. Oliver watched the play. Thoughts on the small freckled face. Half is better than nothing, the face was thinking. Oliver grinned. The face was already trying to devise a plan for cheating him out of his half or whatever it was he didn't even know about yet. Well, I guess we could split. I don't see why not. The boy squatted on the earth before him. In the moonlight, they were dwarfed with the dark shapes of trees above them. A warm wind smelling of summer going over right and looping up the hollow and across them. Banks of sea scented with rich opulence, the ripe pears and musk and honeysuckle. An owl called up lonesome from some hollow negated by dark. Well, it's big. Big, the old man asked in disbelief. Hell yeah, I thought a man as old as you would have figured out himself by now. Boy, you've lost me. Figured out what? Digging up in big. Oliver felt like a participant in some sort of real conversation in which the answer for no relation to the question. Lines had been fragmented and shuffled indiscriminately. They got an idea. Is that what you've been doing out here of a night? And them sad. Hodges was nodding. To take them home, to take them home in, he said. Lord God, boy, you don't dig pigs up out of the ground like taters or something. <laughs> you want them all to yourself, you want to see the <laughs> Whoever told you pig was dove? My mama did, and I don't know what cause she'd have for that. I see, Oliver said. I asked her where they come from, and she said the old south rooted them up in the hog pen. And you're not having a hog pen. He sat in a ruminative silence, just smoking the pipe and listening to the night birds, somewhere far and lost, and streaking down the night to whistle of a train. And what do you figure? Just kind of eliminate the south? Bypass your sort of? Just give your pigs up ahead of it and sell them? Yeah, a person smarter than a hog, ain't <laughs> We won't argue about it, Oliver said. 
That's what that folks listening to it, and I work up the other religious said. Finish up watching the Lord. This community of hog rustlers self confessed and unrepentant thieves of unborn swine. They were the spout of burlap bags and eyes caught the livestock creatures. Oliver thought little it was lovable. It had a moment of clairvoyance and inside a weary corner of itself with regret. They knew that Cutter Hodges would always be slipping in and out and digging up somebody else's feet. They would always be playing the long shot or taking the shortcut figure an angle in somebody else's game, and he would never have a game of his own. If he lived until he was grown, he would be shot clean or shoot someone else in the field and have cold up. He and a cohort had mad as they, as they looked as they looked the gas at each other across the body of a fallen grocer or a gas bomb fallen brother. If he won the game, he'd be in Russian Mountain Penitentiary if he lost the graveyard. Oliver felt a pity for him and commiseration for the things that had been and the things that were yet to be. He wished for words to encourage him, to enlighten him, but none came. And his own life did not lend itself to example. Well, what about it? What about what? I mean, I think P, you were going to split like we said, or you're going to dig him up after I leave and keep him for yourself. Boy, there ain't no deeds there to do. You done got them. God damn it, son, that ain't where bitties come from. I done told you that. <laughs> so you say. Well, there's a considerable body of evidence to back it up. <laughs> <laughs> and where does the old sow get them? Oliver took a day to rest. All right, he said, they grow there in the south, and when they're big enough, when they're made, they come out. Come out, the boy echoed. He was shaking his head, staring at Oliver with Oliver in wonderment. Everybody says you're crazy and back out you are. <laughs> you're crazy as hell. I never heard such a crock of bullshit in my life. <laughs> well, the old man said, don't blame me for it. It's not like I laid it out or anything. It's always been like that. I'm going to tell Mama what she said. He arose and took up the burlap bag and the shovel and hurled them over the fence and clambered after them. Keep you damn pigs, he said. I don't mind you being gravy, but I hate to be cooked for a fool. <laughs> Oliver ran to himself. He watched the snake, he called. After a while, he could hear Hodges scurrying down the embankment. A small, bright, angry head and thread in the pastoral tapestry of night sounds. He hung his cell in the barn lot while listening, and then he arose and went on back toward the house. That's all I have to say. Well, after the impact of the song, I thought it did. And I had to raise something else. Oh, we can just do questions and answers. Probably the resort coming after the road.
winter that year was hard and mild. Then a fall spring came in late February, and overnight the world softly altered. First it off the woods in the oak and hickory budded and sprouted tiny leaves like archetypes of emerald grandeur and a frustrated blossom in a riot of white and pink. And on crying one ridge, the wild plum trees from the abandoned orchards were banked like when plum snow with it. The new growth of leaves and may apples softened the abrupt harsh angu angularity of the ridges. And a warm wind looking up from the south set everything in stir and gave the world an elusive equality of a mirage, everything with blurred green motion. Yates took heart. Since the beating, he was much in the woods, avoiding any place at night in that day, sleeping wherever night fell on him, and he welcomed his moderation at the temperature. He saw this early spring as a gift from the face, a balancing of some cosmic scale. The scent of wildflower rubbed the winds and he moved it through this hygienic world with a new kind of confidence. He began to think he might make it after all. Come March and a hard breeze sets everything in ice. Each blossom, each twig, each psychotic belief. The muddy earth erupted in crystal fumes of ice and he hooked himself against the bitter wind that had shifted northward. Beneath the wavering bowl of orange light and bonfire corn, and peering upward into the frozen heavens, the edge could see the very air freezing before his eyes. The glittering crystals of frost formed and drifted wavelessly to the earthward and vanished in the fire, and beyond the wall of heat, a circle of hoar frost formed on the earth, the earth around it. He suspected some suspension of the natural balls, some aberration, some other sleep at the wheel. Senility or madness overtaking whatever God controlled the weather. He crept watching his house from the shelter of a windfall pan, off and on for days he'd been watching the place, but his ribs still ached and he had not approached it. Who knew where not in the night, who knew when not in the night turned up, he was ruthless and slow, he might be anywhere. Night and struggle was long gone, broken windshield and all. But not himself might be hunkered in a darkened corner, trading an ash by some beast of childhood nightmare. Yet there was no smoke from the chimney, no light from a night fell. He wondered where his mother was, his sister. He guessed his mother was laid up somewhere with nothing, but he had no idea where a he might be. He had a thought for the chill of the night, for wayfarers on the road, for the cold heart of stone before she fell over his head. Gus was drawing down the hall of that sleep, the known world telescoping toward, telescoping inward on itself. A chill wind carried a few tinsy flakes of snow, leaves flashed softly like faint distant chimes. He'd been living out here in the open until he felt barely human. Just something resembling other folk, yet with some grim twist to mark it, set out in these hills and brush arbors like some outlandish mascot to the human race. Some cautionary reminder of what can happen when your love goes south. It was turning colder yet, and last night he drank to the living room, stove, and his bed. Somebody might as well be getting the use of it, he said aloud. He took up the club he tackled and carrying and wound down the hillside toward the house. With his rusted roof and weathered dark planking, the house seemed to focus for drawing off such light as it was, the wing and gaze up through fading window panes to the dark beneath beds, the city corners of the closets. He entered the tumble to the door behind him with some caution, but there was only the smell of dead ashes, cold steel fire, a sort of numbing silence. The first thing he looked for was the lamp, and he lit it and reloaded it and stood for a moment fastening both handed for the yellow kerosene heat. Then he turned his attention to the heating stove. It was packed almost full with what he used papers and grocery bags and found more and gems at the end along with a dress that didn't fit anyone and an ancient straw hat that had a combustible look about it. Then he paused and looked about the room to see that anyone left, left him a message saying where they'd gone. There was no road around, and if there was missing at all, it was in the floor of things and in silences, and there was nothing at all in any language he knew. 
Then they set a wall calendar from some lost year where a trail of ancient tempered and defiance of gravity from the hill of the cloud. They thought of Carmi in her own cinder wings and just fire hanging in the corners of the room like smoke. And you have to lift the newspapers and wandered into the kitchen in the off chance that they might have left any food. They hadn't had a warm meal and they didn't know how many days and he envisioned a hot meal and an hour or two asking before the fire. Then maybe he barred the door and told him happened was somewhere else for the night and took a chance on sleeping in his bed. They found an unlikely pen, which went off and froze the big corn beef hash and he wrecked it into a saucepan and carried it into the living room and set to the top to eat it. Then he noticed the fire had gone out. Why well, won't you burn, you cold son of a bitch, he asked him. They found the kerosene pen and shook it to gauge its contents and up ended it and hurled perhaps a quart of kerosene over the piper. And when he dropped the match in, this time it met his expectations. The papers exploded in glowing orange flames and he was buffeted by an enormous wave of heat. He could hear the fire sucking up the chimney like a freight train. That's more than I got like it, he said. They were sitting crouched before the fire, eating cold corn they passed with a spoon when he heard a strange sound. He cocked his head sideways, hissing. He had his ears attuned for night and struck for his step on the porch, but this is a different sort of sound. A sort of hissing king that rose through the horse croaking street. He kept looking about the room, but the sound seemed sourceless, something out of the very ether. Yes, was a believer in signs and portents, and he wondered, was this a warning of something dire? He had a spoonful of hash broken between pen and mouth when an enormous flaming rat erupted from the depths of the stove in a welter of oil and burning papers like a salamander gathering the fire coals that held the bony dad in the flames and with paws outstretched like the flying squirrel riding the cusp of an explosion and left the phone. Oh, Yates cried, wide-eyed and falling backwards to his trample as the rat shot over him and went scrambling across the floor. His hot little footprints, the smell of burning oil and hair. On the right of the road, he left little seeds of fire like vermin spreading and flaming flame. It pressed up against the wall and spun and came at it like some demented wind up toy. They're throwing it everywhere, he had to cry. They come up with the broom and I could participate in some bizarre game with adding its curiously animate rat. It had climbed the window curtains and he knocked it free, but behind it left small hot flames like roses. The room was filling up with hot yellow smoke that bedded against the ceiling. The paper the room was sealed with began to curl and smoke. He looked wildly about. He ran into the kitchen for the water bucket, but there was no water. And he hurled the empty pail into the rising tide of the fire. The rat lay still and smoking in a corner of the room. Jess began hopping about the room, stomping out little patches of fire, but others had drifted, and burning paper unveiled the fruit from the ceiling. At last, he took up the saucepan and the spoon and went out. It burned all night. He kept fresh opening it with the charred butt ends of rafters and floor doors. It was a long night. Daylight then and crouched over the coals, the soft snow falling, the saucepan set in hot ashes to reheat. He knew he should be on the move, but he didn't know where to go, and he was loath to leave the fire. It was the first time he'd been warned in days. Yeah. Uh, I know that all, most of you have probably read uh, all of his books. Uh, I was surprised at Twilight. Uh, how many people have read it? Twilight. No, that's the long. The long home. Okay. Twilight, you want to say something more? <coughs> I was going to ask you about. I was going to ask you what else they dug up besides pigs. What now? <laughs> in your book, Twilight. <coughs> you, weren't you reading part of that? You weren't reading part of that. 
Yeah. But I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I wrote it. Okay. It was, that was your, one of your first books here. That was the first. Okay. And then in Twilight, they're getting, I was just shocked. It was, it's Southern Gothic, and, um, you know, I hadn't noticed you doing what you did in uh, Twilight, but it was almost like a mystery. And um, this horrible thing was happening, and people were digging up uh, the bodies. Um, and they were trying to hide from the fact that, uh, that this person had uh, done something to human beings that were dead, taking pictures of them. Yeah, they were checking to make sure that their people were buried right, you know. Right. I had seen this, I had seen this thing on the news about someone in the factory. I wonder where you got it. Somewhere up around Franklin or something. Yeah. This guy had been caught in this area and dead probably, you know, with sort of like two people in a casket or body buried in those or people who were and I wonder, apparently this guy was really respectful, you know, he was well off, no class, and all that. And I wonder what what means a guy would go to to protect his kids and then when this kid starts blackmailing, so he starts in the night a little bit. I started asking about a short story, I was going to try to write a horror short story. But once I got started on it, it went well, and it was so much fun. And I think I might do it tomorrow. I could do it tomorrow, but I'm stuck to do it on that day. I'll do a couple of things from okay. that tomorrow. And uh, the people that they were beating up, they had made photos of them in sexual positions with the man who. Uh, he was the undertaker. Right. Don't tell me too much. I just want. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want you to know how much there is in that book. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I read the first page. And it's like, oh my lord! <laughs> <laughs> Here. Okay. Now other questions. <laughs> yeah. Well, you really you kind of answered my question. Um, I'm looking at what you write about, and I'm thinking, where does he get these ideas? And you've got the kernel of the idea from something that actually happened. And then there your imagination. The there was some news for several days, you know, they kept talking about that. I, I think uh, I remember actually. People were, people were out of age, you know, they had people uh, digging up some graves, you know, well, not just amateurs, but like, professional people were checking to see what this guy had buried. And uh, it was just, um, it was just scary to think about it. I said, you know, I couldn't put time to do it, so I had to do it. A little later, there was some guy in Georgia that had done a bunch of, I think he'd been a criminal for him or something. I mean, he was calling by himself and going away. But my guy, my friend Grace, is he's probably sicker than this guy. He's a pretty, he's a pretty sick fellow. He's an extra thing he has to do. Any more questions? Yes. Um, one sort of look at, I would say, you know, most sections of your writing, and it's fairly obvious that it lends itself to a certain cadence when read aloud. I'm certainly going to read it, but I would say, when anyone reads it. And not only that, but just sort of the language is, you know, you use similes quite often, um, you use certain images that would be sort of considered classical illusions, this sort of thing. Um, so my question is, sort of to what extent do you consider your art of writing prose, essentially a poetic art? I mean, essentially what you're doing seems very poetic in nature, um, if not in sort of direct form. So I was just wondering, 
twice and do this for your own writing and sort of any prose that's sort of poetic. I don't know, when I was when I was a kid, I sort of wanted to be a poet, but I couldn't write poems, you know. But I like to read I hear about your poets, you know, and I read I read poetry. Then when I started reading a lot of novels, the writers that I admired were writers that were known for that, you know, for their language being poetic, thought and Thomas Wolfe and stuff like that. And those were the writers that I admired, so when I started trying to write. And I just, I used to get a lot of, uh, before I started getting published, I used to get a lot of rejection from editors. They said, if you'll stop doing all this quasi-poetic stuff, you know, mm -hmm. about storms and rock and all that, and just write the story, then it's probably, this is publishable. But I didn't want to cut it down to the basics. I you know, wanted to just, just tell the story. I wanted, I, wanted to, I wanted to speak the same language. So I persisted and then kind of came around my way of thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Seems there's a, I see a lot of similarities in your writing style. Really? I've never read any of his novels. Oh. I've, read, I've read a lot of his journalism. He used to, back in the 70s, he used to do a lot of journalism. Okay. It was always good. Mm -hmm. And I was, I read the, that memoir that he did, A Childhood. Childhood. Was a very good book, book, by the way. Uh -huh. And um, I always wanted to meet him. And um, a few years ago, Mississippi Public Television was doing this, they did this thing called Laughter of the Southern Renegades. And it was supposed to be, uh, supposed to be me and Barry Hanna and Harry Cruz and uh, maybe it was three of them. Maybe it was supposed to be that three. But Cruz couldn't come. He was uh, his health was bad and he didn't leave Florida and they got somebody else to go to Harry Cruz. But I had wanted to meet him because uh, I read an essay from the band back in the 70s. And he talked to us. He went to Alaska to work on an Alaska pipeline or something. And he was going to write about it. And he was going out drinking with a bunch of these background guys. And he told himself before he went, he said, no tattoos. Don't get, don't, don't get any tattoos, whatever you do tonight. And he said when he woke up the next morning, the first thing he saw was hinges tattooed on my head inside the elbow. And I always wanted to see the guy and see if he really had hinges, see if he could clean it up where he actually had hinges tattooed on his arm. I heard you uh, recently wrote a piece about Faulkner, and I was wondering if you would. Uh, uh, give us a little uh, preview or a synopsis of uh, what you had to say about Paul. Well, what to do? Uh, this English publisher was, uh, they published out collector's type books, you know, like Heinemann books. They never going to do a new edition of uh, As I Lay Dying. And they wanted, uh, probably because of Twilight, And I read the book, kind of, and just wrote it, and it wound up being 
but put it out in words now. I guess I did more to say that. That's probably my favorite Faulkner novel. And I could, uh, it's one of those books that I can sort of just pick up and open it anywhere in it, you know, and start, start reading it. I think it's, um, I think it's just probably one of his more accessible books, maybe not the most accessible, but it's not, it's not as hard to read as Absalom, Absalom, or The Sand of the Fury. The Sand of the Fury is hard to read because you keep jumping back and forth in time, and you never quite, you never quite know when it is, you know, or whether, whether something's real or whether it's something that's very extreme. And Absalom, Absalom is, is probably the most difficult book ever. novel until the time it was published. How long did that take you? Would you, would you ask it, would you study it again? I mean, From the time you wrote your first novel until the time it was published, how long did that take you? Oh, I was writing a novel in the seventh grade when I was in the third. <laughs> <laughs> it's never been published. <laughs> <laughs> I was always trying to write. You know, from the from the time that I got to where I thought I had written a public, publishable novel, it was probably uh, altogether it was probably two or three years 
but I wasn't submitting it all the time. You know, I would get, I would get discouraged and just have to write something else. Or maybe I'd go back and work on that again. And uh, the mistake I was making, I think, was that I went to the, like the prime places first. You know, I would send, if, I would, if I'd written a story, I'd send it to New Yorker and we came back from New Yorker, I'd send it to Harper's or Playboy or something like that. And uh, the novels, I didn't know I didn't know about small presses or didn't know very much about them. And I would send it I would send it to Random House, Double Day, and some of that that. And when uh, when I started sending stories to college journals, you know, the quarterly like Story review, theory review, and things like that, and the story started telling. And then a guy called me who uh, worked at one of those magazines and wanted to know if I had a novel. And I had a long home, which had just come back from Random House. Okay. The rejection, the rejection slip from Random House for the letter that the guy wrote, he said, uh, he said, as a, as a depiction of backwoods evil, it is superb. <coughs> and I, it seemed weird to me that you would, the word superb would be in a rejection slip. <laughs> <laughs> but I sent it to this guy from Murray and Beck. That was a small press, I think, at Denver at the time. And uh, they took it and uh, I just did it with around around telling her, right? Because it's because I met you asleep with it. Yeah. Janet, do you have a question? Yeah. I'm in. No, I've asked a lot of questions about you. There is a site uh, that uh, Sheila Kennedy told me about on the internet. And it's over, is it the city? Uh, it's the Oxford American.